So how long were you in New York City before 9-11? So I moved from Indiana to New York City six days before 9-11, and the, the experience completely changed my life. I didn't know anyone. Um, I was in the bookstore. My first day of class was 9-11. So I was in the bookstore getting books, and the Twin Towers are falling. And it was one of those moments in time that just kind of, you don't really know how to process it. I remember that people were just they, they didn't run, they just started walking really quickly, like ants, just scattering quickly. I went home and then saw on the news what was happening and then heard the fire trucks and ambulances in full gear um, going down the street. And you mentioned the people not running. In the movies, if there's a tragedy, people run. But in real life, people don't run because they don't know where to go. Mm -hmm. People were just in shock. And you know, there was a explosion in 1993 at the Trade Center. So people were thinking, oh, this might be something similar. Should we go on with our daily lives or not? And then when people realized what was happening, it seemed like the world turns up, turned upside down. Who did you call first? Well, I tried to call my husband. As you know, the, the cell phones were just down. For two reasons, because everybody was trying to use them, yes. and at that time, cell phone technology yes. was relatively new. Yes. And then people don't realize that the big cell phone tower for the city right. was on one of the World Trade Centers. Right. So I could not get a hold of anyone for a really long time, and I thought, well, I'm safe. I'm going to let the people who you know need to use the cell phones use them. But then later on, I kept trying to call on a landline, and I finally got a hold of someone. It was my colleague, actually, from Westfield, Indiana. I got a hold of her on my landline, and I told her to let my relatives know, my mom and dad and husband, that I was safe. I will have a landline in my home from here on out. I've always had a landline after that because of that experience. Because of 9-11? Yes. Because you don't want to be in a situation I where you can't get a hold of people. Right. My mom was a school teacher down in Florida mm -hmm. at the time, and she had no idea mm -hmm. where I lived in Manhattan mm -hmm. in relation to the Twin Towers. Yes. For all she knew, I was in the middle of it, mm -hmm. and I could not get a hold of her. Yes, yes. And so she was a mess the whole day mm -hmm. because she didn't know if her son was alive or dead. I was working for the NBA at the time. Mm -hmm. I had to go to the NBA store on Fifth Avenue to use their computer to send out an email to, yes. to, to everyone to say, I'm okay. Yeah. I couldn't even send or receive emails, so on September 12th, all of these emails came in for my students who happened to be fourth graders at the time mm -hmm. and they all were like, are you okay? Mrs. Pangan, where are you? Will you please get a hold of us? And I still have those emails because it was such a profound experience in that way for mm -hmm. communication, not to be able to get a hold of your loved ones. You're married. Yes. And, and you were married at the time. I was married at the time. My husband, though, was in Indiana. So we had just moved and um, he came back to Indiana and I didn't get a hold of him until a couple of days later, but he knew from my colleague that everything was okay. So your husband didn't get a chance to talk to you until several days after 9-11? Correct. What was that conversation like? I'm safe, everything's fine, I'm, I'm not hurt or in the area, so I just remember that feeling of relief, getting to hear his voice and um, just connect with people. Same way with my parents, I just remember the, um, ringtone just trying to get through every time. I, I must have called 200 times. How, how long did it take? Oh, you couldn't call out and you mm -hmm. couldn't get out. Right. The only way to get out of Manhattan that day was to walk across the right. Brooklyn Bridge. Right. You couldn't take a subway out. Cabs weren't mm -hmm. running. You were on an island. Mm -hmm. Did you feel trapped? I didn't feel trapped, but I knew that I didn't want to go out anywhere because I wasn't sure what was going to happen next. My apartment was in between two streets, and one street had the incoming fire trucks that were covered in ash, and the fire um, men and women were just completely covered. It was like watching gray people just coming in and out. Mm -hmm. So they would go up one side, but then the fire trucks and the first responders would get clean and then go back down the other side of the street. So all day long, I was hearing sirens and watching ambulances and uh, first responders just constantly go in and then come out. My job, I thought, was just to stay put and not get in anyone's way. However, everyone in our apartment was new and no one knew each other. Everyone just connected in such an incredible way and we all went in one apartment. There were probably 20 of us in one apartment and we just sat around the television watching this as it was happening in mm -hmm. real time. And then the day after, 
I remember we all were um, walking around and just trying to process what had happened and random strangers would stop and say, how are you doing? Did you lose anyone? How's your family? And people that just just came together in such incredible ways. And that feeling also um, will stick with me forever. Even um, people waiting across the street would have a mini conversation and check in to make sure that you were doing okay. And to people here in Indiana, that seems like, well, yeah, of course, mm -hmm. but you don't realize mm -hmm. in New York City... You just go about your business. You go about right? your business. You know, people <laughs> right. always mind their own business right. in New York. It's that old adage, yes. just mind yes. your business. Yes. That was what 9-11 mm -hmm. changed for the positive yes. in New York. The honking of the horn stopped. Mm -hmm. The yelling out of the cab stopped. The rudeness stopped. Mm -hmm. And it really became a unified mm -hmm. community. Mm -hmm. For a long time. For a long time, say, for several weeks. Yes, yes. And, and we joked that when we started hearing the horns again, yeah, okay, we're getting yeah, back to normal. Right, right. Well, and I remember distinctly the um, pictures along the subway. When you came out of the subway, there were hundreds of pictures with people that were missing or loved ones. Like, have you seen this person? And I think those reminders of people that have lost loved ones and they're still searching, I think that um, also made the community come together in different ways that they might not have experienced before. And it was a constant reminder of yes. the lives that were lost yes. and you couldn't escape it. I mean, yes. it was right there in front of you mm -hmm. all the time. That day, those planes weren't the only planes we heard. An hour later, we heard more planes, yes. but they weren't passenger planes. Mm -hmm. What were they? They were F-15s. They were flying so low, as you said, you could see the pilots. You could see the pilots' and faces. everyone thought that other things were coming, and you weren't sure if um, there was going to be another terrorist attack within the hour, or that next day, or that next month, but it was something that was on collectively on our minds, I think, the entire Time. At yeah. least for the next 24 hours. Yes. And I hear people from, you know, here in Indiana, my friends in Indiana and other places say, oh, we thought we might be next. Mm -hmm. But I tell them, try being in it. Mm -hmm. Because we heard the Empire State Building. There's mm -hmm. explosives there. There's explosives on the George Washington Bridge. Mm -hmm. Word of mouth mm -hmm. exploded everything. Mm -hmm. Everyone had a theory about what was going to happen next. Right. There was one time on the subway a couple days later, people had brought socks and masks and things because they were so afraid of another attack coming and they wanted to be prepared. And so the subway had a malfunction and it stopped and the entire car, including myself, got out our masks and socks and put them over our faces because we weren't sure what was coming. And it happened to be just a random subway you know, mm -hmm. malfunction, but I thought, what a different world we're living in, you know, mm -hmm. now. I went to bed that night for the first time afraid of whether or not I was going to wake up or not. How did you feel when the day was ending? I just wasn't sure what to expect next. I think I had that feeling of it could happen at any moment, tomorrow or a week from now, and how are you going to get out quickly and communicate? And I, I still feel like that. I see different um, spaces and I think, what's the easiest way out of this big group? Yes. And every time you get on a plane, I'm sure you think about it. And every time. Every time. On the backside, that community feel just really is um, embedded in my mind. I have just a special place in my heart for New York City, um, similar to Indiana, because that community just was highlighted in such a profound way. There are three things in the days after that I uh, keep going over and over in my mind. So I was asked to go down to, to Ground Zero, even though they didn't call it Ground Zero at the time, right, they just right. said go down to the World right. Trade Center. I asked my camera guy, what should I prepare myself for? And he said the smell. It was the smell of death and I still can smell it. Yep. I can smell it. Yep. The second thing was, like you said, the camaraderie. Mm -hmm. People with restaurants just saying, here's food. Yes. Just yes. giving away food. Yes. People with Bottles of water here. Do you want yep. a bottle? They just, it was people helping people. Mm -hmm. But the third thing, and I think this is something that you experienced as well, the wind shifting north. Mm -hmm. When you see the pictures of the World Trade Centers on 9-11, and you see the smoke from the buildings before the buildings came down, the smoke is heading out toward the harbor. Right. And it's heading away from the rest of Manhattan. 
Those buildings are downtown. The smoke is heading further downtown. Mm -hmm. But on the second day, this, the wind shifted north, east, and came up the, the island. Mm -hmm. And we got to smell yes. everything. It was like we were all covered yes. in, in death. The smell of ash and burning steel is something that I will never get out of my mind. And I can smell it on my shoes still 20 years later. I don't know if, about you, but we had dust on our windowsills from the wind shifting. There was ash and dirt around from the Trade Center all over. And that's, for days. Yeah. I mean, for it, mm -hmm. it didn't just go away. Mm -hmm. The entire island mm -hmm. of Manhattan was covered in soot and ash all the way up to the Upper West Side and the Upper East Side. You couldn't get away from it. Right. So now you're supposed to be a leader as mm -hmm. far as being a teacher mm -hmm. goes. How did you keep your career going? Because my career was about telling the story of 9-11. Mm -hmm. Your career was something else. Right, so I was in charge of supervising student teachers um, that were going through the program at Columbia. And my student teachers also had a first day of 9-11 in schools. One of the classrooms specifically was a class full of fifth graders. They were on the sixth floor of a building in Chinatown and saw the entire thing happen. They saw the planes hit, they saw the buildings come down, and um, negotiating that with teachers and students and acknowledging um, the trauma that they witnessed um, was something that changed my career. People helping with trauma in classrooms, how do you deal with students who had um, lost parents and aunts and siblings and loved ones. So that work propelled my work for the next three years with um, students and teachers and classrooms. The elements that the students shared were so significant and um, their stories were so powerful as well. And I think about that all the time. I, every 9-11 I think, oh, how, how old are those fifth graders now? Or how old were those kindergartners who experienced that? But we just immersed ourselves in the classrooms and everyone was just in it together, getting through. And even two and three, three years later, students would bring up the fact, well, do you think there's going to be a terrorist attack today? It might, you know, is today the day? They were still talking about it. So it was interesting seeing 9-11 through children's eyes as it happened. Were you worried about the kids' psyche? Absolutely. I, everyone was and is still. I think when you go through something like that as a child, um, it shapes how you see the world and how you interact with others. A student that just comes to mind frequently, she lost her father in um, the Trade Center and then lost her mother in a plane crash two or three weeks later in New York. Mm -hmm. And I think of that student frequently. And I also think about the students whose birthdays are on 9-11 because they will talk about this frequently, that they don't want their birthday to be associated with mm -hmm. going through that event. So in New York, we really make sure to celebrate those students in a special way too, because mm -hmm. they have extra things that they're thinking about. If you were in New York City, you didn't think about 9-11 every day. You thought about 9-11 every minute, and yeah. you talked about it every minute. Yes. Every conversation yes. for months after that was about 9-11. Your decisions on where you sat in a restaurant were dictated by 9-11, what route you took, where you were going to pick up supplies, how were you going to get there, were you going to take the subway or the bus, what was the safest route, what news channels were you going to listen to. All the decisions that people made, they had 9-11 running in the background of safety. Everyone knew somebody mm -hmm. who knew somebody who yes. died. Our neighbor, he had moved down a few weeks earlier than his buddies from Boston because he got a job at the World Trade Center. And then a few weeks after 9-11, his parents came to clean out his apartment in tears. Mm -hmm. He was our neighbor and he's gone. My colleague lost her fiance. She was supposed to get married in October. Like you said, everyone was impacted by death. It was amazing the numbers when you think about how large New York City is, but it really um, was functioning as a small community at that point. You had to process it, you had to deal with mm -hmm. it. There's no other way to do it yes. but just to say, okay, it's, we have to move on. Yeah, and in true New Yorker spirit, and I would say in Hoosier spirit, people just did it. They engaged every day, they did what they had to do every day to move forward and to come together as a community. 
and I really admired that when I saw that in people who were experiencing such different trauma than I was experiencing at the time with a loss of a loved one. I really admire those people. They just kept going. So what was it like to be reunited with your husband? Wonderful, but I think that he was experiencing it for the first time. 9-11 happened on a Tuesday and he got to me on Friday. I saw it through his eyes for the second time. And I think that he was processing all of the environment as well and how things had changed from when he was there just you know, a week prior to this shift in understanding that from this point on in history, things will be completely different. That day I kept saying, yeah. oh, we're, this changes yes. everything. I didn't go to the World Trade Center for a month afterwards. I just did not want to go in that area. I have pictures of when I did go and the building was still on fire, mm -hmm. it was still smoldering, mm -hmm. and just lines of people um, that were putting flowers down, creating the makeshift memorial for, for months. 11 stories of rubble. Well, we were actually in the towers two days before, September 9th, and we were touring all around the city trying to get my, my bearings and getting furniture and rugs for the apartment. We went inside and just all of the hustle and bustle and the magic of the Twin Towers. We didn't have time to go up to the top because we were getting situated in New York. And so I grabbed a pen um, from the gift shop and I thought, oh, you know, we'll come back later when we're all settled. And, and I'm so glad I got that pen because that was, that was the last experience that um, we would have with the building. So did your husband eventually move to New York City? No, he didn't. So he worked for Raytheon at the time. So he was asked to stay in Indianapolis to help with the increase in weapon design in case something like that happened. So he never got to make it out. So he ended up commuting every other weekend to New York City. And so we had a commuter marriage after that, which was not the plan, but 9-11. So 9-11 not only affected you psychologically, 9-11 mm -hmm. affected your marriage right. and made it a long distance yes. marriage. When I say it completely changed my life, it completely changed my life. So you were there for four years. Mm -hmm. What made you finally leave New York City? I got pregnant and ironically my son is named Hudson for the Hudson River. <laughs> so I was wrapping up my doctoral work and decided to come back to Indiana to finish up my dissertation. And so we made the decision to come back and um, work and live here. And we have been here ever since. New York City is still my second home. We actually have student teachers there now who are teaching this fall. And so I get to go back um, frequently. My parents asked um, after that, they were like, why don't you come home or would you like to come home? And I thought, no, I, I really do want to stay. I felt like the students needed the work that I was about to engage in and um, I saw that spirit of sticking together and getting through it and I, I wanted to stay. And you felt like a New Yorker. I did. It I was, absolutely felt like a New Yorker. It, it, was, it takes 24 hours and you feel like a New Yorker. You became a New Yorker mm -hmm. like that. Yes. And that's the way that I felt. Yes. I was a Hoosier and a proud mm -hmm. Hoosier mm -hmm. up until 9-11 and then for the next several years yes. I was a New Yorker yep. because we all became New Yorkers yes. that day. There's a special bond with everyone who I think lived there during that day that um, you just, you feel connected with yeah. that person because you have experienced something so unusual and such a transformation in history that um, it, it leaves a special bond. We were there that morning mm -hmm. and we saw it happen. We survived that, we can survive mm -hmm. anything. Mm -hmm. I agree. The crazy thing to think about not to date ourselves. I know. I knew that, this was coming. <laughs> is that we're sitting on Butler's campus uh -huh. and no student on right. this campus remembers it. Right. So in my classes, I show them my shoes. We play a 20 questions game. They have to ask me questions about the shoes and they have to put the pieces together about where these shoes might have come from or been. And they always think it's from a happy occasion, like a, a first date or... Um, an engagement or something like that, they are shocked when they find out that those are the shoes I wore on 9-11. They are really interested in it. They want to learn about the emotions and the political background and what happened with students. These are students that are training to be teachers, so um, they are really interested and engaged even though um, they weren't around. To them, it's like Pearl Harbor. Right. 
Right, and that's what we talk about. We talk about you are living history every single day. And so the contributions you make, the choices you make, what you experience are all part of this evolving history. So here we are at the 20th anniversary. What does it seem like yesterday for you? It feels like yesterday for me. It feels like it just happened 24 hours ago. Because those images are just seared into our minds. Mm -hmm. And when you start talking about it, the images just start flooding back. Mm -hmm. The store shelves that were emptied, yes. the soot that was coming back up, the fire trucks, yeah. the people. I was hesitant to do this interview because it still feels so raw after 20 years. It just really feels like yesterday. To be in the city that day and to see things, small things, yes. just the small. Yes. The, the nuances. The nuance, the person wandering up the street yeah. and you knew they were coming from downtown. Yes and the look on their face like they had seen death. Yes. The smell, like you can't describe yeah. to somebody who wasn't there, the smell. Mm -hmm. I was in an elevator with a lady, this was Thursday, and it was a security officer in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and she asked, how are you doing, are you okay? And I said, yes, I just moved here, you know, six days ago. She just gave me a hug in the elevator and just said, oh honey, and that's all she needed to say <laughs> but to have um, people really understand that moment in time um, is, is something significant. And there are a lot of tears. Tears just There still are. Mm -hmm. There still are a lot of tears. I like to be peaceful on September 11th or very busy. I don't usually engage in social media that day. It's still a really hard day to get through for lots of different uh, reasons. I think about my colleagues and I think about uh, my students, what they are thinking about and what we all experienced. So it's a hard day. We told ourselves on that day to be strong, mm -hmm. and then we told ourselves the next year to be strong, yes. and we told ourselves the next year to be strong. And there comes a point where you say, I don't know if I can keep yeah, being strong. Right. And you were there September 11th, 2002. And to me, that day was one of the saddest days of my entire life. I remember them playing the names of the deceased in every store, um, down the street, on the news, it was something that you could not escape because everyone was in collective mourning, I think, for these people and their families. And to me, September 11, 2002 was equally um, impactful in that way. I completely agree. I was in Times Square when they were reading scrolling those names. The name, yes. When they were reading the yes. names, the names were scrolling, you could hear a pen drop. Yeah. You could hear a pen drop. Mm -hmm. And that's how the whole day was, mm -hmm. I think. Just, just quiet. Quiet, reflective, um, and collective grief for the people and then where we were as a um, global society. Did it make you stronger? I think the experience shaped my life in profound ways that did make me stronger. It definitely gave me perspective that I didn't have before. I feel really in tuned with people um, in a different way, I think, because of that. You see the world through a different filter. Yeah, you do. How old's husband now? He's 16. He's a junior at North Central. Um, and I have a daughter who is 10. And the reason I'm doing this interview is for her. She um, wanted to hear the story and wanted me to share it. 20 years later, what would you say to them? I would say I can't wait to get back to New York City so we can explore together and I can show you the places and you can experience the people that helped shape my life from that time forward. Making it a positive. Yep, I would make it a positive.